We know today will be a day of family and feast and meals and fellowship, but we've come to have our spiritual feast today, and we thank you for being here. We have a large number, and we're thankful for all who are visiting. We want to invite you to come back and to visit with us any opportunity that might be convenient to your schedule. Please give us an opportunity to get to know you personally and to say we're glad personally that you are here. To our members, it's always good to see all of our members who are able to be here this morning, and we encourage you to invite others that they might come and to worship with us. And to those who are worshiping with us virtually this morning, we also welcome you and thank you for being part of our service. We hope that at some point it would be possible that you might work, worship with us in person. We will follow this service this morning with a Bible study period. <clears throat> we will assemble again this evening uh, at 6 o'clock for an evening worship, and we assemble on Wednesday evening for a Bible study and a devotional period at 7 o'clock. If you were not able or uh, forgot to pick up a communion packet, there are some on the front that someone will bring you, or if you'll raise your hand, one of our ushers will bring you a communion packet at this time. <clears throat> the reading this morning will be taken from Luke chapter 9, verse 23, if you'd like to turn there at this time. I have a few general announcements, and then we will uh, remember those that are uh, sick and not doing well uh, with our congregation. The Keltenberg uh, congregation will have a gospel meeting the 17th through the 20th. Morrison will have a singing Friday night the 22nd. And the Central Congregation will have a Ladies' Day the 23rd with Deborah Kia uh, presenting in that. Also, ladies, you're invited to a bridal shower.
If you'll stand, we'll have an opening prayer and remain standing for our first hymn, please. <clears throat> Our Father, who art in heaven, we thank thee for this day of life. We thank you for the blessings that you, through your providence, shower down upon us. But especially, Father, we thank thee for the blessing and the hope that we have and the promise of eternal life through your Son. Be with us this day as we worship that the things that we think, say, and do would be acceptable in thy sight and that we would praise you in ways that only you deserve. Father, forgive us of our sins and be with us in life for this prayer we ask in Christ's most holy name. Amen. Amen. I've heard of a land of joy and peace and wonderful life, a beautiful place of mansions fair and skies that are After the song, we'll have prayer.
Let us pray. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, holy is your name. I come for you this morning, thanking you so much for all the wonderful blessings that you provide to us, our homes, our livelihoods. Thank you so much for, for our family and our Christian friends. We ask that you be today with those that are sick and those that are mourning. We ask that you help comfort them as only you can. We ask that you, dear Lord, please be with the church. We ask that you help us to, to have the, the zeal to, to make your church grow. We ask that you please help us to also let our lights shine as they should so that we can win souls for you. Please, dear Lord, be with us throughout this worship service. Help us to, to do it in the right manner that is pleasing to you. And please be with us as we go throughout this week. Help us to, to again, be those shining lights that we can win souls for you. And it's in your son's name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. If you're using the book, we'll mark number 29. We'll be using that when the Lord's invitation is extended. <clears throat> now to prepare our minds for to take of the Lord's Supper, is sing 495. I would encourage you very much to notice very carefully the lyrics of this song as we prepare our minds to take of the Lord's Supper. Oh, the death and the riches of God's saving grace. If you would, please go ahead and prepare the bread for the taking of the Lord's Supper. And while you're doing that, I'd like to remind you that from the beginning, God loved man. And even though man was his chief creation, he knew that man would fall. And yet, even at that beginning, he provided a way by which man could live again. And I'd like to remind you what was prophesied by the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 53. And it reads, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he has grown up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness that when we see him, 
There is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Would you pray with me now? Our loving Father, we are so thankful that you do love us and have from the beginning, and that, Father, you have provided a way for atonement of our sins. And on this first day of the week, we remember Jesus, and we remember the body that was, uh, that was tormented, that suffered much affliction, and that hung on that cross and died in our stead. And, Father, we give you thanks now for his, this bread that represents that body. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Here we again pray. Our Heavenly Father, we continue to remind you to remember your Son, our Lord and our Savior. And we see that blood that flowed from his side that he gave willingly, that through that blood might be applied the grace that takes away our sins. And Father, we thank you also for this cup, the fruit of the vine, that represents his blood. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Not only does God give us eternal life through his son, he provides for us for our daily lives. And so with that in mind, let's offer thanks for his provisions. Eternal God, merciful and loving, we do thank you that through your goodness, we receive good things. And we thank you, Father, that through your blessings, we are able to work and we're able to prosper that we might provide for ourselves and for others. And Father, we are glad that we also have opportunity to support the work of the church by giving of our means. And we pray, Father, for those who will see its use in the kingdom. We pray this also in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The scripture reading this morning, as said earlier, comes from Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Well, good morning. It's good to have such a large crowd with us this morning. I'm going to talk about something a little bit different this morning. I'm going to talk about the fear of death. Around the world, everybody is celebrating the resurrection of Christ today. And I think that's great. And there's a reason that he died. And there's inspiration in his death that came, that gave me this lesson. So there's a quote here that says, all men die, but only a few welcome it. There's a gentleman who was an elder at the congregation where Jessica and I worked with before we came here. His name was Ezra Fraley. And uh, he was an older gentleman, and I'm going to tell you about a uh, situation before his passing that took place to help you understand what this phrase means. Ezra had congestive heart failure, and a lot of people know with that, you get a lot of fluid that builds up inside of your body. And I didn't know it until talking with him and talking with the doctors that the process of draining that fluid is extremely painful. 
And he got to the point where he was done having the procedure. He was ready to go home. He was ready that he welcomed death. And the doctor, and so at that point, he was refusing the procedure. And the doctor had a conversation with him and said, you realize if you don't do this, what the alternative is? He says, yeah, I know, I know. His daughter tried to convince him to have this procedure. She's a member of the Lord's Church as well as he, he was. And she tried to convince him to have this procedure, and he didn't want to have it. So I'm, we're all there at the hospital. He's in his room. I'm out in the hallway talking with the doctor and talking with the daughter and everything. And the doctor was talking to me. He says, he, I don't think he realizes what's going to happen if he doesn't have this procedure. And I looked at the doctor and said, I think he does. I said, let me go talk to him just to kind of ease the mind of the doctor and the daughter. And I went in, and he and I had a conversation. I said, Ezra, you know what you're doing, right? He said, I know exactly what I'm doing. I said, I know exactly what you're doing, too. I said, those two people standing out the hallway, I mean, one of them loves you dearly and doesn't want to see you go. But the other one, that guy that's got the degree, he doesn't understand what you and I understand, that this world is not our home. He says, I know. He said, I'm ready to go home to be with Jesus. I'm ready to go. He was one of the people, one of the few people I know that you could say that welcomed death. So we're going to talk about the fear of death this morning. I want to share with you some ways that I've been touched by death in this world. Cancer. I once was visiting with a friend of mine, and he, was, he had cancer, and I was visiting with him and his wife, and he was in a bed in his home on hospice care, and I was visiting with her, and I was looking at him as I was talking with her, and her back was to him, and I looked at him, and I said, I watched him, and I said, I think he's gone. I watched him take his last breath. The idea of alcohol. When I was in high school, a friend of mine, six days before his 16th birthday, lost his life because he was riding his bicycle across the road, and a motorcycle came up the hill at 80 miles an hour. God was drunk and T-boned him and killed him. Death affects us in different ways. Water. I've almost drowned twice in my life, and I don't know exactly what that feels like, and it is one of the most scariest feelings I've ever had. Besides, one of my children went missing one time, but that's another story. But a friend of mine thought he was strong enough, but the current was stronger. And he was a good swimmer. I would call him an Olympic swimmer, but... The current was too strong. Self-inflicted. Several years ago, a buddy of mine had some issues going on, had some problems, and he decided that if he couldn't have both the worlds that he was trying to have, that he wouldn't have any of them. And he took his own life. Sadly, I had to do his own, I had to do that funeral. Fatigue. This was a young man I worked with for a long time. I taught him the gospel. I baptized him. He got out of high school and he was working, doing good, coming home from work one morning after working a lot, fell asleep behind the wheel, wrecked his car. I did his funeral. He was 20 years old when he died. And then this one, years of abuse, I've got a cousin that died over 20 years ago, and he was in a religious cult where the abuse took place. And like I said, long story short, he took his own life by performing a high-speed chase on the internet with the police. And his death was caught on the dash cam of the patrol car. And like it says here, it's in the top 10 police chases on the TV show Cops from the 90s. I got to watch it. Didn't want to. But death affects us differently. As morbid as it sounds, we all must eventually die. But I want to focus on a different kind of death this morning. Not to bring everybody down, but a different kind of death. So there's three kinds of death that we have. And only one of them is voluntary. So we have physical death, which we have no control over that. And you look at the headstone here, just insert your name here. One day, my name's going to be there. We have what's known as a penitent death and then a parting death. So we're going to look at all three of those, these this morning. But as we go through this lesson, I want you to keep this phrase in your mind. You fail the mission because you fear death. You fail the mission because you fear death. Keep that in mind as we go through this lesson. So physical death. Why do we have to die? Well, we don't belong here. God didn't make us for this place. Here in John chapter 14, verse 1 through 3, it says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. 
Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. This is known to preachers as the graveside scripture. This is scripture most preachers will use at the graveside. But when you think about this, we don't belong here. We were not made for this place. Jesus Christ, why did he come to this earth? He came to die for my sins. He came to die for the sins of everybody. Why did he do that? So we could have an opportunity to go to heaven and be with God. Turn, if you will, with me to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. And, you know, each week, each time we're together, we talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's very symbolic. We can, so we can actually go through the same process through the death, the burial, and the resurrection. In Romans chapter 6, uh, beginning, what's the verse 1 beginning? What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Now, Paul's talking to people who have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, that have had their sins washed away in baptism. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who die to sin live any longer in it? We have died to sin. We've separated ourselves from sin. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? This water right back here is nothing special about it. I don't drink tap water at home. I think it's gross. I've got a filter, a filtered pitcher in my fridge. I drink the filtered water. There's nothing special about this Menville tap water here. But what's special about it is what it represents. It represents the blood of Jesus Christ. He says, you were baptized into Christ just as you're baptized into his death. Therefore, because of this, we're buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the, from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been united with him together in the likeness of his death, we certainly should also be in the likeness of his resurrection. The idea that we died ourselves we're buried with Christ in baptism. We resurrect out of that water a new person. And then just like Ezra Frehley was telling you earlier, when we die, we go home to be with God like the scripture says. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when I come again, I'm going to take you with me. We don't belong here. This is why we need to physically die. Another scripture in Hebrews 13, verse 14. For here we do not have a lasting city. We are seeking the city which is to come. This world is not our home. This is the only slide. We're not going to sing, okay? This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. When we sing the song, do we believe it? Do we believe that when I leave this earth, I'm going somewhere better. I'm going somewhere better. Yes, that's why I need to die. We do not belong here. We belong somewhere else. So that's the physical death. We have to die that. Well, here's penitent death. This is the only death that is not voluntary. Nobody can avoid death. You can live as long as you want, do all you can, eat healthy, exercise. One day, you're going to die. But this one here, this is voluntary. This is one not everybody has to do. We're going to talk about this for a minute. Some words, penitent, apologetic, compunctious, contrite, regretful, remorseful, repentant, rofil, sorry. We're going to look at one of these, compunctious. Definition of this is anxiety arising from awareness of guilt. Here in Acts chapter 2. Peter preaching, that all, therefore, let all the house of Israel know as surely that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Sometimes it says pricked or pierced to the heart. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? What shall we do? They were cut to the heart. Who was all the house of Israel, all the people that were listening to this, 
So penitent death, they felt, because of their actions, they felt guilty for what they had done. A penitent man. I remember one time watching a, an old Indiana Jones, an Indiana Jones movie, and he's trying to figure out these riddles to get into this cave where this treasure was at, and he kept saying, a penitent man, a penitent man, and then he got down on his knee and avoided the booby trap. Penitent, someone who's remorseful, someone who's sorry, someone who regrets the things that they've done. And these people regretted killing the Son of God. They were penitent. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9. Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led you to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. Sorrow in a godly manner. This is where penitence is at. The idea we talk about the death, the burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. We talk about our own lives and trying to get close to God. And we need to die, we need to be buried, we need to be resurrected. Right here is the death. Go ahead and turn back to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, the verse that was read this morning. Luke 9 and verse 23. Jesus is speaking. He says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Let him deny himself sorrow. Whenever we think about or want to become a child of God, we think about being baptized to become a child of God. This right here, in my opinion, this step, this process is the most difficult because it says we must deny ourselves. We put away all of our selfish ways, all the things that we've known, all the things that we've learned that lead us away from God and say we put those things aside because I want to follow God. I want to have a relationship with God. And here when Paul was talking to the church of Corinth, he says, sorrow in a godly manner. He says that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. You feel guilt for the things that you did. Therefore, you repent and say, I'm not going to live that way anymore. I'm not going to live that way anymore. You look through the scriptures and you think through the book of Acts of all the conversions. And where is the best example of repentance? of sorrow, when somebody's living a life one way and then they learn about God, they learn about salvation, they learn the things they're doing is wrong, and they completely change their lives, and you can see a huge difference. It's black and white. I always think of Saul. He's killing Christians. He's in agreement with people that stoned Stephen. And then the Lord appears to him on the road to Damascus. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And then we know the rest of what happens to Paul, to Saul. He completely changed his life. He repented of those old things, completely changed. And now he's walking for God and doing for God. You suffer loss in nothing. The idea of repentance is as we completely change our lives for God. This penitent death that I'm talking about is the only voluntary one. I can't force anybody to decide to stop doing the things that are pulling you away from God and start living for God. That's a choice you have to make. But that's what this is about. It's a death that's suffered. It's when we died ourselves. We just mentioned that. Luke 9, 23, we just read that one there. Deny himself. And then this is the only gospel account where it says, take up his cross daily. It's a daily thing. We say, well, I've repented of my sins and I've washed them, had them washed away in the blood of Jesus. I'm good. No, it's a daily death. Because every day there's going to be things out there that Satan's going to throw at us, that the world's going to throw at us and say, you need to be participating in this. You need to do this. You need to not do that. It's a daily thing that I get up and decide, I'm going to live for God today. I'm going to live for God. I'm going to keep pressing forward. So examples of a penitent death. And there are princes, it's a sacrificial death. You do it because you love the person you're sacrificing for. Marriage is a sacrificial death because your spouse's needs come before yours. Parenthood is a penitent death. It's a sacrificial death because your children's needs come before yours. You put others before yourself. 
And here's a biblical example we have of penitent death. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He loved the world. He sacrificed. He sacrificed his son for us. And one thing that people have a hard time fathoming is how far the love of God goes, how far the death of Jesus went. It starts with Adam, and it goes all the way to the last person that is born before Jesus comes back. That's how vast this love is. That's how big this sacrifice was. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, am I willing to die just a little bit on this earth so I can live eternally in heaven with God? Now, of these three deaths, physical death, or this one right here, this is the only one we can choose to suffer. If we choose to suffer that one, we can avoid the parting death, which we're going to talk about here in a moment. So parting death. Here's the definition of parting. The action of leaving or being separated from someone. And you part from someone. And in this case, we're talking about God. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 to 33, and then 41, 45, 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another. And as a sheep divides his sheep from the goats, and he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you accursed into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Then he will say to them, surely I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of these, you did it to, not to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The idea of a parting death is when we're separated from God. We are separated from God. Back to the conversation that Ezra and I had. He knew he wasn't going to be separated from God. He knew when he died that he was going to be with his Savior because he had obeyed the gospel. He had lived his life the best he could while on this earth in order to get to heaven, and he trusted, had faith, and the grace of God to get him there. He knew he wasn't going to be separated from God. The doctor that said, you've got to have this procedure, you're going to die, had no idea about this. He was ready to be with his Savior. Being separated from God eternally because we're unwilling to die for our own selfish desires. To follow the one who will give us eternal life. And that's the question I want you to keep asking yourself. Am I willing to give up my selfish ways in order to follow God? And when you say selfish, it sounds like a really bad thing. But you know, there's a lot of things we can do that are just seem just as innocent as can be that can be selfish because it pulls away time that we have with God. Mark chapter 10, verse 17. Now as going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother, he said to him, teacher, all these things I've kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, one thing you lack, one thing. Go and sell whatever you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, take up your cross and follow me. You've got one thing. You've done everything right. You've got one thing I need you to do. Just one thing. Verse 22, but he was sad at this word. And went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. He was unwilling to die to self. That should be actually hovering over where it says loved him. But he loved him. This is another soul in that gap between Adam and the last person that's born on the face of the earth before Jesus comes. He was unwilling to die to himself in order to be with God. Therefore, he was separated, parted. He told him to take up his cross and follow him. We're told, take up our cross daily and follow him. Three deaths. There is no escape. Again, 
What's your name here? Physical death, penitent death, and a parting death. This physical death cannot be avoided. Everybody will die eventually. But we have a choice while we're living. We can choose to suffer a penitent death. We can choose to die to ourselves in order to live for God. Now, for some people, it may take a huge event taking place, something major in their life to wake them up that I've got to start living right. There's been movies made throughout the years where situations like that have happened, where somebody's living away a certain way, and then all of a sudden, some catastrophe happens in their life. Something horrible happens in their life, and they wake up and like, I need to start living for God. I don't want anybody to have to get to that point, but sometimes that's what it takes. This parting death, you can avoid it to be separated from God. There in Mark chapter 15, if you turn there with me. Mark chapter 15. I want to read something that Jesus said. Of course, this is when he's suffering on the cross. He's been crucified. He's been, all this horrible stuff's happened to him. And verse 33 says, Now when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At that moment in Jesus' life, he was separated from God because he had my sins on his back. And God can have nothing to do with sin. Jesus know, knows, knew what it felt like to be separated from God. And it was painful. It was painful because he'd been with God all of his existence on this earth. We may not understand being separated from God, but being separated from God is painful because if we die while separated from God, there is no other chance. So physical death will happen. You can choose penitent death or not. And then this parting death, you can avoid being separated from God. You remember this quote? You fail the mission because you fear death. Our mission is to make it to heaven, to make it into heaven. And we cannot make it into heaven if we fear death. And what I mean by fearing death, fearing giving up our own selfish ways in order to follow God. We're afraid of whatever, and we're not willing to repent. We're not willing to turn, to the, turn aside from all those things that are pulling us from God. We have to be willing to not be afraid to follow God. The idea of following Jesus. I don't know what it's like. People say, I don't know what it's going to be like to follow God. I don't know what it's going to be like to, to live a Christian life. It's like, well, you never know until you do it. Well, I'm kind of, I don't know if I want to do that. It's kind of scary. And then my response is, well, what are some things that you've done in this life that you had no idea what it's going to be like, but you just went ahead and did it? And after you did it, you found out it was great. You found out it was a lot of fun. You found out it was something that you wanted to do. And the response is, well, there's lots of things. Well, why not try one more? Why not try one more? Why not just start? Don't be afraid. Just follow God. We need to die to self so we can live for God. Die to our selfish ways. So here's the question. Will you die today so you can live forever? And I'm talking about the penitent death. I'm talking about dying to ourselves. I'm talking about saying, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I'm going to stop living this old way so I can start living for God because in the end, that's all that's going to matter. That's all that's going to matter is, am I living for God? I'm going to try to call something to your remembrance. When I, when I first came here and interviewed, I stood up here on a Sunday, and I did my very first sermon for you guys in an interview. It was, I think it was July of that year, and I had, a big long, I had a big rope here, and I had end of the rope right here and a knot right here, and I said, this is our life on this earth, 
And whether it's 15 years, like my buddy who got killed by a drunk driver, or if it's 110 years, like some people live, that's the distance of my time here on earth. And then from this knot all the way to the door over there is eternity. Where do I want to live for eternity? The little bit of time that I spend here will determine where I spend in eternity. So am I going to live my life for God or am I going to live my life for, for myself? That's the question this morning. If you're here this morning and you're a child of God and you've got something to miss in your life, you need prayers, you need the strength of the church, we can assist you. Or if you're here this morning and you are not a child of God, you've never repented of your sins, you've never had your sins washed away in the blood of Jesus Christ, this eternity, I don't want to be with you. We have to decide, am I going to be a child of God? So if you're here this morning and you decide you do want to be a child of God, you want to make that confession, you have your sins washed away and become a part of his family, we want to assist you with that now while we stand and while we sing. Oh, to Jesus I Well, good morning. I want to welcome each and every one of you. We're glad that you chose to be with us here at Bobby Branch Church of Christ this morning as we worship God. So we've got a good number in attendance, and we're especially glad to see each and every one of you this morning. We know that we have visitors, and we're glad that you chose to be with us, especially glad that you chose to be with us. And we hope that you'll come back and be with us each and every opportunity that you can. 
If you are here with us and visiting and you're in search of a home congregation, we encourage you. We're going to have Bible study here in about 15 or 20 minutes. Stay with us through Bible study. You get to meet some of the members of the congregation. Certainly meet with myself and the other elders and learn what we're doing to spread the gospel as well as edify ourselves in God's word. So, Also, we know that we have those who are viewing us on Facebook or YouTube or or perhaps Ben Loman TV. We're glad that you're viewing our services. Our services, we are in-person services, uh, each and every service. So if you're in our immediate area, we certainly encourage you to come and be with us here at Bobby Branch Church of Christ. In speaking of encouragement, I want to speak just briefly about our visitation program. I want to remind uh, all of us, uh, if you are here, if you're not a part of our visitation program, certainly want to encourage you to be a part of that good work. This is something that each and every one of us can do. It takes no special skills. All it does is, all it requires is for you to care. And so, you know, you have to send a card, to make a phone call, to pay a visit. Uh, if you would, if you're not a part of the visitation program, I encourage you to see Brother Herb Rowland or Brother Ricky Hurst or Kurt Maynard or Joe Collins. They'll be glad to put you on one of the visitation teams. If you are on a visitation team, and tonight will be visitation team three, if I'm not mistaken, uh, I encourage you to be here to be a part of that and to be a part of the visitation program. If you are here and you are a part of visitation team three, and you know that you will not be able to be, see your team leader today before you leave. I'm sure that he will be glad to set aside some cards for you so that you can continue to participate in this good work. So, Jason, thank you. Good lesson, appreciate that. Brother Leonard, thank you for the song selection and, and leading us in those and well. So, this time we'll have one more song and a closing prayer. He is my everything. Father, we are so thankful for this day. We're so thankful for all the people and members and guests and visitors that we have with us today. We pray that they've heard something today that will affect their lives for the good. Heavenly Father, we ask you to forgive us of our sins. We know we often fall short of what you expect from us as Christians. We ask your help and overcome life daily struggles so that we can call heaven our home when we leave this earth. Heavenly Father, we also ask you to be with the teachers this morning as they have prepared their lessons to teach the classes that their students can gain benefit from it. Heavenly Father, we ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.